despite decades of research and the implementation of countless injury prevention strategies, serious injuries and fatalities continue to plague the construction industry. That last-minute changes are a significant cause of painful mistakes, even deaths. Can technologies prevent or mitigate these situations? Research Team 382 identified the common causes of last-minute changes, then scanned technologies to find which solutions are ready to respond to challenges today and which promising approaches require further development. Here to present their findings are Michael McGeo, Sean Bevan, John Gambertes, and Chumma Nagi. <laughs> All right. So, um, good morning, everybody. My name is Mike Mugio, and I am the chair of uh, RT382. I'm a, also an environmental health and safety manager from Con Edison. And I'm here as the chair of the team to present the, um, the results of our research from the technologies to prevent serious injuries and fatalities related to last minute work changes study. Today I'll be giving the presentation along with my co-chair, Sean Bevan from FLOOR, Dr. John Gambentis from Oregon State University, and Dr. Truman Nyaji from Texas A&M. As we saw yesterday during the safety index uh, indicators, CAI companies are doing an excellent job in, re in regards to our injury rate but it's kind of flatlined over the last few years. And we're still seeing a, a significant amount of fatalities across the industry. So we're hoping that the information that we provide today can be used in, at your companies to help drive that zero harm, zero accident culture. <clears throat> As you can see, we have a very, uh, our, our T382 is comprised of a highly experienced, diverse, and if you saw from last night, a pretty exceptional karaoke group <laughs> uh, from industry and academia, representing both owner, design, and construction organizations, as well as technology providers and insurance organizations. That's a last minute change, I guess, all right. So study scope, what was our study scope objective? So in a perfect world, we give worker a, a worker a task, and they aim to complete their study in a uh, their task in a timely, efficient, and safe manner. And that's indicated on the screen by the green check mark. But as we all know, nothing goes according to plan, and some sort of change would occur during their operation, whether a broken tool, uh, traffic conditions, and so on and so forth. So what is a change? A change is an unexpected, unplanned, non-routine deviation in a condition, action, or process. And the research team uh, said that when a change does occur, that is, the, that is a chance of something bad happening, such as a significant injury or fatality, better known as a SIF, and that's indicated over here by the red X. But we also looked at the, what is that these things manifest from a last minute change. So what is a last minute change? It's a difference between a regular change, but a last minute change is a change that occurs or manifests at the work phase when there's limited time available to plan and address for the change. All right, so the team, is this, the team looked at how we can use technology to help bridge that gap between last minute changes um, and help prevent these SIFs from occurring on our job projects. So what does this look like on, in the real world? So we, let me give you a quick example. Let's provide a, an urban environment, let's call it New York City. I mean, that's where I work out of, so why not? And we have we very busy area, a lot of traffic, a lot of pedestrians, a lot of outside safety influences that occur on those projects. And in this instance, um, a worker was tasked on working on a high pressure gas main and trying to repair a valve. And in doing so, the worker had to um, put a bypass onto the valve. And when he put the vibe pass on, he started trying to close the valve, and he noticed that the valve wasn't closing uh, as it should. And that is your change, something that was unplanned. But it was something that the worker noticed. So the worker then had to make a decision. Well, if I leave this bypass in, I can't open the street again, and now I have the city breathing down my neck to open the street. We know how uh, city streets can be during rush hour, right? 
Then the, the, the outside influences coming from uh, members of the public because the uh, sidewalks and the roadway are closed and from their supervision to get the job done on time. So the worker made a conscious decision in this case to try to troubleshoot this um, bypass. And in doing so, the valve stem built up from, um, the, the valve stem ended up being built up from high pressure gas, ended up shooting out like a missile, nearly missing the employee and his worker. All right, and thankfully none of them were hurt during this, so that was the potential to having a serious injury or a fatality. But this could have been a catastrophic event. We could have had workers that were killed. We could have had an explosion and um, worse to the members of the public. So a question arises as whether technology could result, could have been used to implement and to mitigate the change to prevent the result, uh, to prevent this result. And the hypothesis that, that, that there is is that technologies, whichever technology it could be, can be used and be implemented to prevent SIFs due to last minute changes and lead to safe completion of the work. So what are the characteristics of a last minute change process? So the research team began by documenting the process and steps that are undertaken with the respects to change at the work operations and site conditions. So while performing their task, workers continually monitor the work and the operation and the site conditions. And then through situationally, being situationally aware of their surroundings, the worker identifies that there is, is a, a change that might have occurred. And so the worker then identifies the change and then comprehends the cause of the change. The, work, the worker then tries to mitigate or, and adapt to that change by projecting the risk and deciding what to do and then implementing the selected option. And then the worker may try to improvise, which has been shown to be a precursor to a significant injury and fatality. So next, the research team explored the nature of significant injury and fatality type incidents to confirm that last minute work changes are related to these type of incidents. And the research question was asked, are last minute changes related to serious injuries and fatalities? And with the example that was provided before, the answer is yes, there is a high potential for serious injury and fatality due to a change on the project. So to assess the connection between last minute changes and SIF incidents, the research team reviewed approximately 180 cases investigated through the NIOSH Fatality Assessment and Control Evaluation Program, better known as FACE cases. The team found that the incidents that were caused by a change is around 41% of the incidents that have occurred. But that number can actually be higher because um, about 30% of, of the cases didn't have enough information provided and we couldn't make a determination of whether this uh, significant injury or fatality resulted from the change or not. So for those cases that did have a change, the research team evaluated whether the change could have been classified as a last minute change. And 71% of those cases that included a change, the change would have been considered by our definition a last minute change. The research team also evaluated how connected the affected worker was to the change in terms of time space, and work operation. In the if the change is not very connected to the worker, it was rated as a low connectivity. If the worker caused the change or was, a highly, a connect or was closely connected to the change, it was rated as a high connectivity. As shown in the chart above, um, around 50% of the changes that have were so shown to be highly connected to the affected worker. And this result, uh, this results uh, indicates that any technology that would be implemented should be implemented at the worker level. The research team also was interested in the types of changes that led to significant injuries and fatalities. And as you can see, by, see in the chart above, um, the, the greatest number of uh, SIFs were related to uh, worker equ uh, equipment usage, work process, uh, work area intrusion, and worker equipment path. Thanks, Mike. <clears throat> Before t determining if technology could be used to reduce SIFs, the research team had to determine the types of technologies available in construction and how they relate to last minute change. As you can see, there are many technolo different technologies available, including technologies such as BIM, 4D CAD, virtual and augmented reality, autonomous robots, drones and wearables. 40 technologies applicable to last minute change were identified. 
And these technologies, they can be organized into seven broad categories, including communication and mobile computing, sensing, visualization, monitoring, automation, site control, site access, art and artificial intelligence. The research team collected detailed information on each of these technologies related to its features, its capabilities, availability, and many more characteristics. The information was compiled into a technology catalog and will be available in the final report. One of the more important aspects of technology success and to the extent at which is ready for use. So technology readiness assessments, or TRAs, are conducted to evaluate a technology's readiness for use. Based on the assessment, a technology readiness level, or TRL, is assigned to the technology. TRLs are commonly ranged from one, which is basic research, to nine, which is fully developed and operational, as seen in the graphic prepared by NASA. The research team evaluated each of those technology categories and assigned a TRL rating. As you can imagine, communication and mobile computing rated the highest. I mean, all of us have a, a mobile phone at a TRL rating of nine, whereas the artificial intelligence received the lowest rating of five, which means it's still in development and only used for demonstration use. The next step in the study was to determine whether technologies could actually mitigate last minute changes. So the research team asked two questions. Which technologies could mitigate impacts of last minute change and which technologies are likely to be adopted by an organization? Answering these two questions will help identify those technologies that are particularly effective at mitigating last minute change and therefore should be adopted and or developed further. If you look back at the situational awareness steps a worker goes through to identify and mitigate last minute changes, the research team mapped each of the technology categories to the situational awareness steps. All but communication and mobile computing demonstrated that they could monitor and identify and comprehend last minute change and even send alerts. Only site access and site control and artificial intelligence shown any ability to determine and implement actions when last minute changes occurred. Of these two, only site access site control are at a high enough readiness level for use. All right, uh, thank you, Sean. So um, the next step in the research was to try to narrow down this catalog of technologies from 40 down to something that a company might want to choose to implement. And so we took it upon ourselves as a research team to uh, analyze the different criteria for selecting a technology and based on a couple things, importance and also applicability. And I'll focus on importance here initially. So as shown in this table, uh, we're looking at uh, how important a technology criteria is to a, an organization. What does not show on here is it's important, first of all, related to safety, right? Safety and last minute change. But beyond that, what else is important? And as you can see here, effectiveness rose to the top effectiveness, then cost, then ease of use, and so forth, on a scale of one to five, uh, low importance to high importance. The red values there, 3.5 and three for type of control and extent of development, those were two categories where we did not reach consensus for our research team. However, the others, the black ones, we did reach consensus. So those are the importance categories that an organization typically focuses on. The second thing that we looked at is for those importance categories, how applicable are they to each technology category that we talked about previously that Sean mentioned. So we did another analysis where we looked at applicability and scored applicability. And that's in this next table here. So here we are saying how important is effectiveness, cost, ease of use type of control to worker condition sensors or to worker location sensors. And you can see the, the weighted average there 
a little some statistics that we do to come up with a, an average rating based on both the importance and the applicability. Narrowing down now to which of the technologies would an organization really want to, to move forward and, and apply. So now we're getting closer to what we should focus on. We also look back to what Mike mentioned previously, and that is the NIOSH face cases. And those NIOSH face cases showed us an important result. And as you can, if we go back to that chart that Mike showed, we see that the types of changes that lead to uh, incidents related to predominantly uh, equipment usage, process, and worker equipment path. And when we saw that data, we saw, okay, there are two different categories of technologies that we should focus on. One being worker equipment proximity technologies, and two being work process, a change in the work process. You have a planned work process, you go about your work, and then there's a change in that work process. Can we detect that change? Can we mitigate it through technology? So that's our next step in our research, which is to then investigate these two different technology categories. Thanks, John. Yeah, so as John said, the research team then focused its efforts on these two technologies. The equipment, equipment proximity alert technologies, which monitor the surrounding equipment and alert operators and workers of potential hazards. And then the next technology was smart construction and artificial intelligence, which could be used to identify whether there had been a change to a planned work process and act to mitigate that change. The research team used a combined combination of equipment user surveys, targeted technology evaluations, and applications of the adoption protocol, which will be discussed later in this presentation, to explore each of these technologies further. To get in a little more detail, the worker equipment proximity alert technologies, like I said, are located on the equipment and alert operators and workers of hazardous proximities to the equipment. In some cases, we found that these technologies can actually take control of the equipment, for example, to keep the operator from moving into a hazardous area, a defined hazardous area, or stop the equipment if workers become, are in danger close to that piece of equipment. Proximity alert systems are available that utilize a variety of technologies, such as RFID, computer vision, reflective material sensors. And these technologies we found are, are, are available, as, can be available as standard equipment on the original equipment manufacturer, or they can be produced from a third party and installed practically on any machine. The smart construction and artificial intelligence work process change technologies are those that are able to detect change to a planned work process and then take action to mitigate that change. There are some systems that have been developed that contain AI capabilities and are able to perform parts of the situational awareness, but most of these systems are still in development and require full development to fully realize the full capabilities of AI. What the vendors are promising, of course, is that the future systems will actually combine engineering, planning, and staffing data, along with monitoring systems, such as some of the technologies identified today, to combine a complete ecosystem to, and to provide full situational awareness to last minute change. All right, thank you very much, Sean. Okay, so we've gone through a lot of information. We've gone through the identification of technology, We've also gone through the process of figuring out what criteria would be relevant if you have to select these technologies, especially looking at it from a safety perspective. So how do we take all this great information that we went through in the research and use it um, in our organizations? So this phase of the presentation is gonna be looking at how we can provide protocols and processes that you folks can follow if you are in the process of identifying the right technology to use to help improve your safety, especially within the context of last minute change. Now to help us develop the protocol, um, we have two fundamental questions. The first question here is gonna be, what adoption factors are gonna be important within the context of 
reducing SIFs that are tied to last minute change. The next is um, what protocol should be followed to decide whether to adopt a technology or which technology to adopt if you have several options. Um, as Sean had mentioned, we looked into proximity sensing technologies. We have several of those on the market right now. So if you were to decide which one to use, how do you do that? Um, we have previous studies that show that most companies do not necessarily have a process to arrive at that answer. It's based on experiential knowledge or basically looking at what your competitors are doing or what your um, colleagues are doing or what the vendors provide for you. But we want to provide something else that you could use to arrive at, at an objective decision. All right, so the very first step, um, we went through the literature to find all the factors that are applicable to the context of this study. And um, we identified about 44 different factors uh, which can be classified in five different categories. Um, we went from the 44 and we tried to narrow them down to the ones that are very important, which we did, working closely with the SME experts, or the, ex the ex experts we had on our team to help us narrow that down that list. Now, looking at the categories, um, the first category was the technology category. So the factors that are intrinsic to the technology. And um, as you would um, uh, kind of like assume already, the, one of the most critical factors would be the impact of that technology to safety. So look at it within the context of proximity sensing alerts. Can the technology help us monitor the environment, detect when there is a change, and provide an alert to the walker um, who might be in harm's way? So that's going to be the impact it could have to safety. Other factors include triability, reliability. Can we consistently get very good results? Um, we had other categories such as organization. And um, here we've, we've heard from multiple presenters that one of the key issues with innovation or getting innovation into your organization is having a champion, for example. It's working closely with the top management to have buy-in from the top management. All these are organizational factors that we have to assess before we go forward with a particular technology. The third category we looked at will be external influences. One of the key influences will be regulation, the clients. We have a lot of owners here. If the owner asks you to include a technology, there's a high chance that you have to use that technology, but that might move the cost upstream to the owners, which then will make them to be a little bit more resistant. But again, there are several factors that can influence the um, adoption of this technology from an external perspective. The fourth is a critical factor, which is tied to um, the individual. A lot of times we adopt technologies and we ignore the folks who are gonna be using it, so the boots on ground, the folks at the work face, which is wrong because we will not gain diffusion if we keep on doing that. So it's critical that we assess these technologies with their inputs and also figure out if it's something that they can use and use it effectively, so providing the right training um, uh, ensuring that they have the capability and capacity to use the technology. And the last is something that I found very interesting, which kind of resonates with the earlier discussion about supply chain. You know, working closely with the vendors, the folks who have these technologies, who, know, who, who have that domain expertise, um, you need to work with them, but you need to also ensure that they have the expertise in terms of providing you with that training for your workers if they need it, and other after-service um, after sales services as well. So after going through the factors, we had to then come up with a protocol. Now in the knowledge base, um, it, you will have access to the protocol that we came up with, but this is a simplified version that I'm gonna be running through here. So the very first is gonna be what do we do? How do we start the process of integrating the technology into our, into our, into our workflow? First of all, we recommend that you wanna have what we call a preliminary feasibility evaluation where you look at the very critical um, factors that if a technology does not meet those factors, you will not go forward. This saves you a lot of time. So things like cost, um, its effectiveness, and um, the ability for us to scale the technology if indeed adopted. Now we will have checklists in the reports that you can use to help you know, formalize this feasibility evaluation process. The second is a, a more in-depth review of the technology. Again, this is you assessing the technology based on what I just went through in the previous slide, those five different um, categories. Assessing the technology to ensure that it meets 
um, those factors within the categories. And the third is something that we realized based on our focus group and our Delphi process, where we saw that having the capacity to try out these technologies within the given context is going to be critical. So we, we again provided um, a checklist that you can use if you want to perform a pilot test within your organization, or you could also work closely with a third party to help you evaluate the technology, again, with your context in mind, so they can provide feedback with regards how well it would work. Now, if a technology goes through these three steps and comes out good, then we believe strongly, based on our results, that you will be able to adopt it and it will be able to perform well within the context that you have in mind. Wonderful, thank you, Dr. Naji. So um, we have a number of tools that you're uh, at, our, your, at your hands to use. The protocol that was just mentioned, the technology catalog that's available to you. And so takeaways from this research, I think, are very important that you can implement in your, in your uh, organizations. I'm going to talk a little bit here to wrap this up about what we think are some of the additional takeaways for the CII community. And so uh, recommended action and needs based on our uh, survey of technology, our evaluation of uh, last minute change, and also our evaluation of safety and how those three merge together, those three different topics. So first of all, if you are uh, involved in safety, you understand the hierarchy of controls. And the first thing that you try to do is you try to eliminate the hazard. And what's the hazard in this case? The hazard, perhaps, is that last minute change. So we recommend that in all that you do, try to eliminate changes, especially last minute changes. When you do that in your planning efforts, then you will eliminate the issues that come about with last minute changes. So try to do that through good planning, uh, pre-planning, and so forth. Uh, good monitoring, and then you will not have those last minute changes. Secondly, we recognize that we have quite a few technologies, as Sean mentioned, uh, but we need to do some more development and then implement them. We see two focus areas that uh, Sean mentioned as well that we need to focus on, and that is worker equipment proximity alert technologies and also work process monitoring and alert technologies. If we focus on those, we're going to address the reasons that we have SIFs, serious injuries and fatalities, as a result of last minute changes. Those two will hit most of the issues that we see as concerns. So develop those, implement them in your organizations. We realize also, as Mike mentioned, that situational awareness says we're going to monitor, we're going to identify, we're going to comprehend, we're going to decide what to do. And then we are going to also implement what we're going to decide to do. But our technologies really don't get us that far yet. We need artificial intelligence to help us out. But artificial intelligence, as we've heard in the conference, is a bit in its infancy. And the TRL is perhaps fairly low. So we need to develop that AI a little bit more, pursue that development of that artificial intelligence and then we can get to the point where we can do everything within that situational awareness process. Lastly, we need to develop and fortify technology integration. Lots of technologies, they are all designed for a specific use case, but we need something that integrates all of those technologies. We heard about data, AWP, we need data. Well, that comes from multiple pieces of technology. So we need something that integrates all of this together at a higher level, maybe in the cloud. So we need an integration, but we also need to do it real time, right? We've got that last minute change. We want to do something about it right now before that worker makes a decision that could be a safety issue for them. So how do we do it where we integrate all of our data and also do it in real time is an issue. So we need to pursue that as an industry. Two other things that we think are important are, are more on, this, on the issue of how much technology and is it effective or not. So the first one is something that is called levels of automation. 
And perhaps you've heard of levels of automation. It came out of the 1970s where a, a researcher proposed 10 levels of automation. And it basically says, where are we on this, this progression from the human does everything at level one down to the technology or the computer does everything in level seven through 10. Not only where are we, but where do we want to be? Should we be at level four? Maybe if it's a critical lift or something really a big issue about safety. Where does our organization wanna be in terms of how much technology we wanna implement? Because we rely on technologies a lot and they're good for some things, but maybe we want the human to be involved for other things. Humans are not perfect though. So we need to find that right balance. And I encourage your organization as you move forward is to, what is, to figure out what that balance is. Where do we want our, our humans to be involved? Where, where do we want our technologies to be involved? So levels of automation. Secondly, uh, is a relationship between readiness and effectiveness or potential technology effectiveness. We realized as we went through this that we have technologies that are fairly ready to use, the TRA, the TRA that gets us the TRL, but maybe they may not be effective or the effectiveness is not there yet. And that effectiveness is the ability to mitigate impacts due to last minute changes. So let's go through the different quadrants here. As you can see, technology readiness on the horizontal scale, technology effectiveness on the, on the vertical scale, and the lower left quadrant might be technologies where they, they kind of need some further development. They're not yet ready, they're not yet effective because they're, we can't get the value out of them that we want. So they're either further development is needed or they are really not applicable. They're not really gonna do what we want. Second category might be on the lower right, which is acceptable, a title we gave to this category, where they are highly ready, but maybe not really meeting our needs or not very effective. You can perhaps imagine some cat technologies that fit into that category. Upper left might be a promising category. They are maybe still in the development, low readiness, but they have lots of potential. What fits into that category? Maybe AI, right? Lots of potential there once we get that perfected. Lastly, the upper right is impactful. And that's where we wanna be. Highly ready, very effective in uh, providing us value for our projects. And so as we go through our evaluation with our protocol is where does it fit in this, in this chart right here and try to identify where that is. And that might guide us as well. With that, I'd like to say thank you from the whole research team up here, and we have some members in the audience as well. Thank you for your attention, and we have some time for questions. Thank you so much. Excellent presentation and excellent research. We have a few questions, and we have a few minutes, so let's, let's take advantage of that. Uh, I, this one is, to me, uh, fundamental. Most construction workers have a get or done mentality. What training? materials are available to help the boots on the ground guys embrace and gals embrace the technology and not try to bypass the systems. What are your thoughts there? So, yeah, so one of the things that we, we looked into while we we're doing the research is actually bringing um, some of the technology and some of the surveys to the actual workers that would be using that technology. And if we got buy-in from them at that start, rather than just um, saying, here's a piece of equipment to, we want you to use or a tool we want you to use, and we know how that goes normally, where it ends up in the back of a trailer or in a truck somewhere, but we're actually giving them, we actually think it's beneficial to give them the opportunity, the worker, to actually help pick the technology that they feel would be best for them to be using. Okay. Yeah, I can, I can add to that. Um, <laughs> with regard to specific materials that folks can use, I know there's been some push now um, from the Department of Labor um, around the use of drones. So the, the is a training material around like the safety risks tied to drones that is available to everyone in um, the Sus Susan Harewood safety program. So, you know, you can always access um, such materials. 
Uh, and in addition, I think that's one area that actually needs more research. I know I've spoken to Dr. Gambit and, to, and some other researchers about how do we come up with um, information, training materials that would help, not necessarily to convince per se, but to help inform workers about the benefits of using um, the technologies. Because a lot of times they, they, they might see it from one perspective, like with wearable devices, they will be thinking about, oh, I have to give away my privacy and uh, I might have issues with data security, but there are intrinsic benefits. So how do you communicate that? There is little research on how best to do it, um, but that's something that we are trying to bridge in the near future. But resources, Susan Harewood will give you some information about the use of drones. Thank you. Okay, very good. What types of AI, artificial intelligence technologies, do you think are most promising, and how long will it take until they are ready for widespread use? <clears throat> I'll take a crack at that. Um, we did actually talk with a few vendors that, that do have uh, some technology out there. They're actually working with uh, some other owners because as, as we learned last night, you know, the AI needs data and lots of data. And so the data sets to feed the AI engine to develop those models, those are actually currently in the works. But again, those models are uh, uh, in the beginning stages and so there's been some limited implementations of, of AI. One of the examples was um, a, a particular project that was actually having all the camera feeds, because a lot of projects now have uh, cameras on site, and the AI was actually reviewing all of the video feed coming in, and it could pick out if, if there were workers that weren't wearing their PPE properly, or if there were high congestion areas, um, so, and that's kind of where uh, the start of AI is really coming, is, is, is actually taking in the, the video feeds and, and images. So I think part of the next steps would be to, to bring in the, the planning data on top of that, so you know what work is actually, that is scheduled to be executed versus, you know, what are the workers do, out there doing at the moment. Very good, thank you. And so a few questions, or a couple at least, regarding the acceptance by the people of these tools. There's a lot of discussion on tools, but what is it being done and what kind of input is being asked from the people on the ground to, to, to help in that acceptance of using the tools? So in the, example, in the example of the valve, what technology should have been used to prevent that in your assessment? Ooh, uh, that's a great question. Um, I, I think one of the AI technologies would really be able to be beneficial on site condition um, and monitoring the site conditions and maybe something that would be able to identify whether the valve had a, um, a high pressure gas buildup. Um, so again, that's still, a lot of that technology is still in development. And I understand like we were talking, like Chuma mentioned before about the wearables. A lot of people don't wanna be wearing, let's say um, yeah. monitoring devices. But um, if you really kind of show them through the process when we choose the technology that this is actually really beneficial to you. It's not spyware, but it's really something there to help you. It'll probably be more accepting to them. Okay, I understand. Going back a little bit to the fundamentals of your research, I believe, is a question regarding what you guys think is the connection of last minute changes to safety as is, is it the same for injury incidents as it is for fatality incidents? I guess we'll take that one again, all right. So. <laughs> Um, the short answer to that one is yes. So if we're able to find something that, a, a technology that can prevent a last minute change and prevent a fatality, that, that technology could be used to prevent a significant incident or a life changing event to someone. So they all go hand in hand together. Maybe I'll add, if I may Please, add to yes. that. If, if you go back in uh, safety research history, uh, there's a lot about um, what causes an accident, right? Accident causation. And one of the quotes that I remember as I went through school is, um, the cause of the incident or the accident can be managed, but the severity or the outcome is very fortuitous. And so whether it's an injury or a fatality, it, it, we can't control that necessarily, yeah. but, that, but we can control the input of what the cause is. Okay, thank you for that. What about behavior? What was considered in your research 
regarding the behavior and how technologies could be used to address behaviors in last minute situations? I can take a stab. So for the study, um, we recognize that a big issue is gonna be the behavioral part because it's one thing to get the, the information to the workers and another thing for the worker to respond to that information um, because sometimes the worker just ignores the information. So um, we, we hope that in the near future as we get more familiar with this technology, as we try to reduce the barrier um, associated with the technology that the workers will see benefit because a lot of the safety concerns that we have, yes, a lot will be tied to the system, but a lot come back to the worker as well. So ensuring that they have a complete buy-in, I think that was one of the recommendations that we have, and that was one of the reasons we have in our protocol, um, the individual section where you have to bring them in, they, you need the feedback from them before you go forward We adopting the technology, because if you don't have that feedback from them, you end up deploying it and they end up ignoring it. And we've seen that with some of the, the vehicles that has great technologies to detect fatigue and, and so forth, but sometimes they can numb the technology because they, they feel it's just you know, big brother. Or with the productivity alert systems where they can shut it off because they feel it has a lot of false alarms. So bringing them in early on and, convince, and again trying to make them see sense in using the technology, that would help them drive the human behavior. Okay, so I have more questions, but I, the one that just came to mind, what surprised you? What were you guys not expecting in your research that you thought that it was an aha moment for you guys? Anything that comes in, to mind? It, it was a two year research and I think we only scratched the surface on the amount of technologies out there. There's so many amazing technologies and we would, every time we had a meeting, we'd find something different and I was just really blown away by the types of technologies that were out there and I'm like, wow, how have I never even heard of anything like this? or something as simple as just, you know, reflective vest um, monitoring devices to, um, for operators to, for them to see what's going on. Something very simple. And we would just come across new things all the time that were just amazing. And I just think it's getting more amazing as time goes on of where we're going with technology and for worker safety. It, if I could add, um, there was actually one particular case where we Almost, we tried to have in our monthly meetings um, a vendor come and present to us their technology to try to, you know, survey the landscape. And when, there was one particular vendor, we actually saw him twice. And they, based on the, the when we talked to him the first time, and it was it like a year later, uh, they had actually completely changed their uh, strategy on the direction they were going with their technology because of the research they had done on their first implementation. So it's, it's constantly evolving. Uh, and I think that's what another challenge is going to be. Okay. And so there's one more, a couple more actually, because I keep getting a couple questions that are important to ask. But uh, before I get there, <clears throat> somebody says, can we really afford to keep waiting for AI? <laughs> How about co-developing? Good point. What do you guys think? Uh, I can uh, take a shot. Um, okay. I, I know a few companies right now have like inno innovation departments and I believe like Floor, Scanska, Bettel and some other you know, companies are beginning to look at um, the whole idea of how do we um, co-develop some of these technologies, mm -hmm. either working very closely with vendor, vendors or you know, trying to take most of the heavy lifting um, within the organization. Uh, we, we, we think that it's doable um, if you have the right skill set and you have the data available to you, um, because it's still going to come down to data. You know, do you have everything in house? Do you have the expertise? And if you do, then you know it's going to be easier to either do it in house completely or work closely with a vendor. Now, I'm not trying to say that we should ignore the vendors. The vendors definitely have the domain expertise, so you will need them in some ways. But you can also start in house in doing some of that. If you want to add something, please. Thank you, Chuma. Maybe I'll add to that as well. And something that surprised me too, and I showed it here, the, the levels of automation. And we're in a very dynamic, complex industry, right? A project is very complex, dynamic, lots of moving parts and things like that. And so does it really come down to using technology? Can we ever get there? Are we ever going to get there? Do we need to do something right now? And how do we balance the humans and the technology. And I remember reading an article, I think we talked about it in our research team meeting, about how do you future-proof your workforce? 
and the, the uh, author talked about having your workers do something that humans do well and having your technologies do something that technologies do well and train your workers to do those things and develop your technologies to do the things that they do well and then maybe there's a balance between those. I think it's a really important issue within the industry is what is that balance going to be? And we can think about that now as we develop our technologies into the future, what do we want them to, to do for us with, when we have that uh, human technology interface? Well said, well said. So I, I cannot finish this segment without asking because we got a few questions here, requests for Mike to show us your lucky sock. Oh God, <laughs> I bought Pink Floyd socks last night. So there they are. That was great. <laughs> Take advantage of that, you know. <laughs> Very good, thank you. Thank you for the questions. Thank you for the panel presentation. Thank you. Appreciate it, thank you. Very well done. Thank you, gentlemen. Who submitted that question? I got a few of those.